introduce Dr. Joel Bielaski. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me here. Um, just, just as a real be brief background, um, I am a physical therapist. Is my clinical background. Um, I got a bachelor's degree in physical therapy when you could get a bachelor's degree in physical therapy. I, I worked for 14 years in the clinic and primarily in the orthopedic outpatient setting. Um, Christmas Eve of 2004, we had an opportunity to drop into our lap and so um, we moved to Gainesville, Florida and that's where I started working my PhD. Um, and I got that in 2008 and been clinical fac or faculty at UF um, since then. So, so since 2005, essentially, I've been working in academics and my current role was that I teach and I do research um, at, at UF as well. I think that's all you need to know. Um, in Florida right now, uh, which is not unusual for a lot of the time in Florida, but particularly right now, if you got to your car, there's about a quarter inch of yellow powder on everything. Um, so it's allergy season in Florida. Uh, I, I do pretty well, except when I talk. And so, so there, there is the problem. But, but talking does tend to get this up. So, so I've uh, been vaccinated. I'm boosted. I had COVID about six weeks ago. I tested negative for it um, recently. It's allergies, but if uh, if I do have to go to the cough drop, then I apologize for that. I will try to keep things together. All right. So, without further ado, um, so, so most of you probably decided or made the decision to come here because of the, the keynote speakers. When you found out that the conference was being offered again, you looked to see who was presenting, you saw the keynotes, and, and I'm assuming that that resonated with you, that, um, that the decision was made, that these were people that you had heard talk before, or you read things that they published, or were aware of them, and, and that kind of stimulated, stimulated you to, to want to come and, and see them in person as well. Um, so, so what I'd like you to think about then is, is if you settled in, you came here, um, or you were online and watching, and, uh, and it came time for the keynotes to start, and, and what if when the keynote speaker was supposed to start, these two came out instead? <laughs> and, and what I would guess is that even if these two gave exactly the same presentation that the keynote was expected to give, they gave word for word what the keynote speaker was going to say, it's likely that you still wouldn't take as much out of it. You'd probably be disappointed in, in who was presenting. They wouldn't have the credibility. You wouldn't listen as hard to what they were saying or try to process it. And, and certainly, come Monday or Tuesday, when you went back to the clinic and started to work with your patients again, you wouldn't be as likely to take that information and try to start thinking about how, how this may change what you do in everyday clinical practice. Patients are no different. So when patients come to see us in the clinic, they have expectations, they have preferences, and no matter how good of a technical job you do with an intervention for them, what I'm gonna talk about today is, is that the therapist matters, and, and you as a, the person makes a difference in the outcomes that are seen. So the objectives for today are first to describe therapist effects, what they are, how big they are, and what kind of implications they have for clinical practice, or may have for clinical practice. Um, we'll identify some therapist-related contextual factors which may enhance the therapist effect, and we really don't know. This, this is not, it's been studied and known they exist, but, but why and why one therapist is better than the other is, is not well studied and not really well known. So I'll talk about some of the potential key players. And then describe some ways, we'll finish by describing some ways we may leverage this effect so, so that potentially in clinical practice take this knowledge and, and potentially enhance the outcomes that you see. So if, if you think about a patient that comes to see you for a problem, and in this case it's, it's shoulder pain, and, and if you go to the literature and, and look at how best to manage a person with shoulder pain, you're, you're likely to be disappointed. Because what tends to happen is what tends to be found in the literature is that getting treatment is better than not getting treatment, but individual treatments really don't distinguish themselves very highly from each other. Uh, and the effect sizes are relatively small. So no matter what's done, the effect size for people with pain doesn't tend to be all that, all that big. And one of the reasons behind that is that a lot of times, particularly in research, they take these individual patients that you're seeing on a daily basis and they consider everybody to be the same. So a research study that's interested in people with shoulder pain will recruit a sample of people with shoulder pain, 
and then give them all an intervention. And the assumption is that everybody with shoulder pain should respond to that intervention. But in reality, what happens is that some of those individuals are going to respond and have very good outcomes, but some of them are not going to respond, and some are even going to get worse. And what's thought likely happens is that the true effect gets washed out because you have people getting better, people getting worse. When you look at the average effect, it's not all that impressive. Um, what's been suggested then is if we can stratify people, if we can get better at classifying or categorizing patients, then we may be able to better identify people that are likely to respond to a given intervention. So rather than taking this one-size-fits-all approach and treating everybody the same, if we can identify characteristics of patients that are likely to respond to something in research, we could recruit a sample then of individuals that fit those criteria and likely see bigger, bigger responses. In clinical practice, we could be more efficient with our treatment as well. So we have a better chance of identifying our patients that are likely to benefit from something that we want to use with them. But probably just as importantly identify patients that aren't likely to benefit so we could look for other things that, that they may be more likely to benefit from. In, in clinical practice, some of the approaches that have been done for this are, are looking at how we can stratify. So again, rather than treating every shoulder patient with your go-to set of exercises or modalities or manual therapy interventions, what can we do to stratify an individualized treatment? And there's a number of approaches that have been attempted. One is based on prognosis, so looking at individuals based on the prognosis for whether or not they should do well. And one example of this is, is looking at psychological factors, using something such as the OSPRO yellow flag or the start back tool to look for people that have high levels of psychological features that suggest that if they have an acute condition, they're more likely to develop a chronic pain condition. And if they have a chronic pain condition, they're less likely to manage that well. And, and so if we can do this at baseline, if we can identify those individuals, rather than doing the same thing, we can modify treatment to hopefully give them a better chance of, of getting better. Because by definition, those are the individuals that aren't likely to get better with our normal approach. We need to do something different, but the first step in doing something different is identifying them so we know that we need to modify treatment for these individuals. Another approach is the clinical prediction rule. It's looking at a cluster of signs and symptoms that suggest that a patient may benefit from a specific treatment. And then clinical practice guidelines may also help. These offer evidence-informed um, ideas or, or opinions on, on the best treatment. What treatments are going to be the best for an individual, given individual, with the attempt to reduce variability in clinical practice? Give people a, a list of, of what they can and should be doing with the hopes that most people will do that and you'll see less variability. So all of those are options for starting to, to personalize care and give patients the, the best care available. But what we know is that there's huge variability in response to treatment, and there's also variability between clinicians as well. So it may be that the, the therapist on my right there does very well with patients with shoulder pain, that her pa patients with shoulder pain do really well. The therapist on my left maybe doesn't do quite so well with, with those. And so if you look at their average responses, what you'll see is on average, the therapist on the right, her outcomes are much better in the patients that she sees with shoulder pain. Um, there's also, though, tremendous within ther therapist variability as well. And so even if the therapist on the right is completely evidence-informed, if she's memorized all the clinical practice guidelines and doesn't deviate from those as well, when you look at within her patients, some of them are going to get better, some of them are going to get worse, and, and some of them are going to stay the same. So not everybody's going to respond the same. The same thing on, on the left. If the person on the left does everything the clinical practice guidelines say you shouldn't do, when you look at his outcomes, you're still going to see that some of his patients get better, some of them get worse, and some of them say the same. So there's a lot of variability within each individual therapist, and, and that doesn't tend to get accounted for. So when we think about the responder approaches and, and how they've typically been done, and what, what we take a, typically have tried through the profession to, to, to get better outcomes and, and bigger effect sizes, they really focus on the responder, but the responder of the patient to a given intervention. 
So the idea with those is that if we can identify the intervention, identify the patient that responds to that intervention, then it really doesn't matter who the therapist is. The therapist is kind of takes a back seat in that with the focus being on what's the best intervention for this, this patient at this time and without really considering as much who that therapist is because that really shouldn't matter. That, that should not have as big of an impact. As long as we know this person is going to respond to a, a certain exercise or a manual therapy intervention, it really shouldn't matter who's providing it. What I'll ask you to think about today is, is the opposite of that. What if instead of that you start to think about responders to a therapist, where it doesn't necessarily matter what the therapist does for the patient, but this is a therapist that with this particular patient is likely to have a, a positive outcome. Uh, full disclosure, I, I don't think, I, I don't. This is not the end all be all. This is not the, uh, the, the magical answer to, to pain by any means. Um, so, so I don't want you to think that I'm proposing that everything else has been a waste of time and, and now we just should focus on the therapist. But, but what I do think is this has been an under-considered and an understudied area and, and probably another piece of the puzzle. You know, pain is obviously complex and, and there's not going to be a single answer. But, but considering the therapist and, and their role in the outcomes may give us a, a chance to, to have better outcomes. And what this is really doing is taking away the traditional view of the, the therapist or the provider as providing an intervention as, as their true role, but actually that relationship between the patient and the provider as being part of the, the, the treatment as well, that the relationship itself becomes part of the therapeutic benefit that the patient receives. So by definition, therapist effects are the consideration that some therapists consistently achieve better outcomes with patients than other therapists, and these differences are not due to random error, patient characteristics, or other systematic sources of error. So something inherent to the therapist plays a role in the outcome that's seen beyond the treatment that's provided. And essentially what this accounts for is the amount of observed outcome that can be attributed to an individual therapist. We know that therapists differ in their abilities and differ in the outcomes that are seen. And this was a study that was done in psychology, which I think really shows this, this very well. And I'll, I'll talk you through, I know it's small and I know that the screen's not gonna show it well, but I'll talk you through it. What they were interested in is, is looking, this was from a big data set of a bunch of uh, mental health providers and looking at, at a, a large number of their patients, but they looked at multiple outcome domains, which I think is really a strength of this. Rather than just focusing on a couple of outcome domains such as pain and, and disability, they looked at a number, 12 different outcome domains over here. And what they first looked at was how many patients reliably improved. So over an episode of care, did the patient show reliable improvement within each, each of those domains? Reliable improvement was defined as the minimal detectable change. It was essentially change beyond measurement error. So low bar, but, but that is how this study defined reliable change or reliable worsening. No change were just people where the change did not exceed uh, measurement error. And without overlooking at this, what you can see is that what you already know. If you work with patients, you know that some patients get better, some patients get worse, and some patients stay the same. But what this found was similar findings, but across a, a lot of different domains. And so you can kind of get a sense that on some domains, more patients showed progress than others. Um, mania, they didn't do so well with. They did much better with depression. So, so there were differences across the different domains. They then wanted to look and see the pervasiveness of, of effective therapists. So what percentage of therapists were effective in, in each of these domains? And again, you can see varying effectiveness across different domains here as, as far as what percentage were effective, but then also what percentage were harmful. So what percentage of therapists, when a patient came to see them following the episode of care, that the patient actually left worse than when they started with them? And then this is what I think is probably most interesting from this study. What they were interested then is, is how many competencies were therapists, um, or how many different domains were therapists competent in? And so they broke it down as far as being competent in no domains, all the way up to the total if you're competent in every single domain, meaning that on average, your patients show reliable change across every, every one of the domains that they were studying. And I think if we start up here, 4% of the therapists in, in this study were not competent on any domain. 
So that meant 4% of the therapists that were in this study, at best, their patients didn't get better following the episode of care, and at worst, they were actually worse after they had seen the therapist. I guess the glass is half full would be that 96% of the therapists were at least competent in one domain. No therapists were competent in all 12 domains. This is the superstar, the sample here, who was competent in, in, in 11 of the 12 domains. But what I think is really interesting to think about with this as well is that even though this is kind of the superstar, this is the, the one that, that is outstanding in, in, in 11 out of 12, whatever percentage that is, but it's a high percentage. If you compare that person to these 45 down here that had a low batting average, they were only competent in, in one out of 12. But if you think about a patient coming in, and if that patient comes in where the domain that they really need help in is the single domain that this therapist here can help them with, and that happens to be the single domain this therapist here is not very good at, they may be better off seeing one of these individuals up here. So therapists differ in where they're competent and how, unfortunately, most therapists, at least uh, mental health therapists, are going to be competent in at least one, one domain. But there is a wide range at how competent they are and, and what domain they're competent in. They looked at the effect sizes here. And across the board, small to modest effect size. If you just looked at everybody's small to modest effect size for everything, except for depression, which was relatively large. But if you look at the effective therapist versus the harmful therapist, quite large effect sizes there. So the effective therapists were quite effective. The harmful therapists um, had large effect sizes, but not in a good way as, as far as their, their patients getting worse. Another study considered this as, as well, using a different data set and different outcomes. And what they found in their study was that high-performing therapists, their outcomes were actually two times better than the average performing therapist. And, and high-performing therapists were actually three, got three times better outcomes than the lowest performing therapist in the study. So there can be a pretty dramatic difference between how effective somebody is. And then the last thing that they looked at was the correlation. They looked at the correlation between the different outcome domains um, across the therapist. And what they found were relatively low associations across all of those. And so what that suggests is just because a therapist is competent or effective in one domain does not necessarily mean that they're going to be effective or competent in other domains as, as well. The magnitude of the therapist effect has been studied. A, a relatively recent systematic review looked at this in psychology. And what they found was across all studies, it would count for about 5% of the variance. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, which, which is small, but, but it's, it's acknowledgeable. Naturalistic studies, meaning those that just, um, that just followed people, cohort studies, observational studies, about a 5% um, therapist effect. And, and what was interesting, a little counterintuitive, is that in randomized controlled trials, the therapist effect was actually found to be bigger. So it was about 8%. And, and, and why this is counterintuitive is that randomized controlled trials are very heavily controlled, obviously. They're, they're very strict with the criteria for who gets included in it. The therapists performing the interventions are trained and monitored to make sure they don't deviate. And a lot of times, even the, the um, interaction between the therapist and the patient is scripted as well. So they do everything they can to keep consistency across it. Even with that type of control, still a substantial um, ther therapist effect. And, and I think the important thing to take from this is that the therapist effect is present regardless of the type of study. So it appears to be small magnitude, but, but relatively robust. It occurs in different kinds of studies. This has been looked at in musculoskeletal pain as well. This was a, a secondary analysis of four different studies that all looked at people with spinal pain. And in each study, it was a comparison of an exercise intervention versus what they called a biopsychosocial intervention, which for, for most of them was cognitive behavioral therapy. And so what they found was that less than 2% of the variance in the outcome, in which was disability, could be attributed to the treatment. Um, larger amount of the variance in outcome, which is disability, could be attributed to the therapist effect in up to 7%. And this is a relatively consistent finding. Um, this study and, and a number of others that have looked at this, particularly in the field of psychology, find that the therapist effect tends to be larger than, than the treatment that's being studied. 
What they also found in this was that the larger effect um, was found too in the more biopsychosocial type of interventions. So, so a larger therapist effect was found in the delivery of the cognitive behavioral therapy and, and to a smaller extent the, the exercise treatment as well. So again, acknowledgeable that, that the therapist effect does occur relatively small. And so the question then is, is how clinically meaningful is that? You, do these small effects really mean anything to individual patients? And that's what this study attempted to look at then. So this is a study that was done in psychology as well. Very interesting approach. And what, what they were really, they, they were interested in the size of the therapist effect, but what they also were interested in this is, is what if as a system you monitored that and then got rid of the poor performing therapists? So what if you kept track of, of everybody's outcomes and it, at certain time points you identify that these therapists aren't cutting it and so you got rid of them and then replaced them with, with other therapists? What would happen in, in that situation? Um, what they did is, is they, they did use a big data set from this, and they simulated the therapist population. So they randomly selected 1,000 therapists from it, and then from that 1,000 therapists, randomly selected 50 of them. They then simulated patient outcomes. So each therapist, they, they took 30 of their patients, and, and with the 50 therapists that were being assessed, that gave them 1,500 patients then to, to simulate their outcome. They followed them over a 10-year period and looked at the outcomes over a 10-year period. Um, but every quarter, so every three months, they would go, they would identify the, the low-performing therapist, the low-performing 5%, take them out, and then go back to the original data set and, and replace them with a random selection of, of additional therapists from that. And they just continually did that. So the first figure over here shows just what the difference was between the high-performing and, and the low-performing therapist. They broke it down at, at 5%, so this is a small effect from the therapist effect, 10%, which is a, a medium effect, or 20%, which is a high effect. In reality, most studies are gonna are find that the therapist effect is somewhere in here. So if, if we do conservative, we can say that the 5% the is probably a, a conservative realistic estimate of, of what the, the actual therapist effect is. The y-axis shows the responders, so how many patients were responders over this course of time. X-axis shows the time frame. And what you can see is that the high-performing therapists are in the gray here, the low-performing therapists are in the black there. Small effect size, but over time, hundreds of more patients are gonna be helped by the high-performing therapist than by the low-performing therapist. If you take it at a high um, effect size over here, more than 10 times the number of patients are gonna be helped by the high performing therapist as we're helped by the low performing therapist. So what this suggests is that even though this is a small effect, it's an acknowledged small effect, it has potential to, to really have meaning clinically with, with the number of patients that you're gonna see. This is what they found when they then looked at it. What if you got rid of them? You know, what if, what if you identified the low performing therapist and got rid of them? With everybody included, they had about a 50% success rate. So about half the patients that went through ended up being successful based on their criteria. If there was a small therapist effect size and they went through the process of continually removing the low-performing therapist, that jumped up to a 57% success rate, medium effect size, 61%, and a large effect size, 66, 66% uh, um, responders. So again, what that suggests is if you monitor this and, and really work to kind of push people to the high responders, there may be significant clinical impact from that. All right, so, so having then determined or hopefully convinced you that there is a therapist effect, um, you know, the next question is why? Why, why does that occur and, and what's responsible for that? Certainly there's likely specific factors. So it's likely that the therapists that have strong training and are strong manual therapists or strong movement system experts able to identify movement impairments or really good at giving appropriate dosage of exercise, that that, that has a role in why one therapist, you know, this therapist is just better at prescribing exercise and dosing exercise and this other one, and, and that plays a role in why that therapist's outcomes are gonna be better than the other therapist. Traditionally, when this has been studied, though, 
this doesn't pan out as being overly influential. And, and what does tend to, to be more influential in studies are these contextual factors, particularly when we're talking about pain. So factors such as expectations, such as preferences, such as the relationship between the provider and the patient, those typically seem to be more influential in, in why a therapist is, is more effective than another one. And so while acknowledging these, this is what I'm really going to talk about for, for the rest of today. And so these contextual factors are not unique. I, 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 I think that sometimes people think of contextual factors as placebo and, and with the idea that if these are a major factor in why somebody gets better to an intervention, that intervention is not effective because it's a placebo. And so by definition, it's, it's not effective. And, and I hope to that, uh, I, I hope you don't think that or to convince you otherwise. Contextual factors are, are present, I would argue, in any intervention that, that we do for pain. One, one of the best examples, I think, of this are these open hidden paradigm studies. And, and in this type of study, there's at least two arms of the study. These are essentially placebo mechanisms studies, so there's studies that are looking at the mechanisms behind placebo, but what's really great about these, or really interesting about these, is they don't use placebo. So everybody gets an active intervention in this type of study design. In these type of study designs, they have always done with medication, um, but one group gets the medication, but it's in an open manner. So there's an infusion device that has the medication, the infusion device is in the middle of the room, the patient sees it. A physician wearing a white coat walks into the room, tells the patient, you're about to start getting a very powerful pain relieving uh, medication right now, and then in front of the patient turns the, the machine on. The other arm gets a hidden infusion, and so with that, the infusion device is behind a curtain. The patient can't see it. It's set up on a timer, and so it goes off and on on its own without the patient's knowledge of it. So the patient isn't aware when they're receiving the medication. This is an example of a study that, that took this approach. This was done in thoracotomy patients, so highly invasive surgery using morphine and, and looking at the effectiveness of morphine. The black circles down here are the open infusion, so these are the group that knew they were getting the medication. White circles are hidden. They did not know they were getting it. And what you can see is that when the, the individuals were aware they were getting the medication, significantly greater um, pain relieving effect of the medication. They also looked to see what would happen if they turned the infusion device off, either with the patient's knowledge or without the patient's knowledge, and the opposite occurred. Individuals that knew that the device was being turned off had significantly greater pain and a quicker rise in their pain than if they were not aware that they were no longer receiving the medication. Exact same medication, exact same dosage of the medication, but the context in which it was provided made a dramatic difference in how effective it was. Again, that doesn't mean that morphine is nothing but a placebo, that it's ineffective. Morphine's a powerful pain relieving drug. It's known to be effective. It's known to work through specific mechanisms, but what it does suggest is the context in which it's administered can make a dramatic difference in, in how effective it is. And the argument that I'll make with, with what we'll talk about the rest is, is that, that it has to hold true for physical therapy, massage therapy. I, any intervention that we do as conservative intervention for people with pain is going to have a, a contextual factor to it, a mechanism to it. We'll talk about some of the non-modifiable factors that can influence the, the relationship. I, I had to look long and hard to find that one, so I was uh, proud of that. Well, one is the sex of the provider. So, so one is, and what I think is interesting is some of what we're going to talk about, I'm, I'm going to talk about it very superficially, but I, I know some of the other talks and, and the one prior to this, I think it get into a lot of these factors and a lot more details that, that, that open it up to consideration. But the sex of the provider is, is one consideration. As far as reporting pain, men um, traditionally report less pain to women. So if a man is, is in the presence of a woman being asked to report pain, they will tend to report lower levels of pain than if they're in the presence of, of another man. There's also preferences based on um, sex. I was happy to hear that there's some massage therapists here today because massage therapy is, is one of the um, professions where, where this, is, this does seem to be uh, an issue and that studies that have looked at this have found that both men and women typically acknowledge preferring a, a female massage therapist. 
this was a, a really interesting qualitative study that, that looked at this, and, and they interviewed massage, male massage therapists to, to find out what it was like working in this setting and what some of the, the barriers that they had based on, on their sex. And what they talked about was that, that men, particularly heterosexual men, often did not want to work with them because they didn't want to be touched by another man. Um, and, and women, too. They talked about women thinking that they had ulterior motives for wanting to be a massage therapist, that they were just doing it to get close to, to women or that there was something sexual about it. One of the therapists, and this is the, the title of the article, too, one of the therapists that they interviewed about this talked about how when he was working with a woman, he was continually telling himself not to be creepy that he felt that he had to be very careful how he interacted and, and how he worked with them because of that. So, so the sex of the provider can make a difference in the interaction with, with the individual patient. It may have an influence on the outcomes that you see. Concordant care, and, and again, others will talk about this in, in much greater detail than I can and, and with much greater insight into it than I can, but this is the idea of kind of congruency between the, um, the, the patient and the provider. So similar ethnicity, um, similar race, able to speak the same language, and, and what role that has. Culture adaptation is, is basically your ability or the therapist's ability to, to take the best evidence-based care but adapt it to that individual patient based on, on their culture. You know, if, if, if the, the best evidence supports an intervention which is not going to be acceptable to that patient for, for culture, beliefs, whatever that may be, how can you adapt that so that it, it either works for that patient or ignore the, the best evidence because that patient wasn't represented in the studies that looked at that? And then cultural competence is basically how good of a job you, you, you do at that, how good you are at actually taking that knowledge and considering the, the different patient beliefs and cultures and, and then able to, to modify your interventions based on that. Concordant care has been shown to make a difference. Um, it's been shown that patients prefer providers that are similar to themselves in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of able to, to, to speak the same language that they speak. This is associated with willingness to seek care, um, adherence to, to recommendations or to treatment, and then outcomes as well. And one study found that 5% of physicians in the United States are black or Hispanic, but they managed approximately 25% of black and Hispanic patients. And of those 25%, a quarter of them indicated that the, the, one of the things that they really looked for in, fi in finding a provider was um, someone that it was based on race or ethnicity. So they wanted somebody that was more similar to, to them. And, and so then that kind of brings us to the elephant in the room. I think somebody earlier talked about occupational therapy. For physical therapy, it's, it's no difference, it, different as well. That when you look at, at the typical, and I can only speak to, to physical therapy because that's, that's what I know about. But, but for physical therapy, this is the typical physical therapist. The APTA released um, findings on I thought it was real interesting. I think she said that occupational therapists were um, around 83% white is what, what was said earlier. We have you barely beat that, that physical therapists are, are over 84% white. So if, if you think about you know, concordant care and, and giving individuals the opportunity to, to work with providers more similar to themselves, there, there's not a whole lot of options in the physical therapy field. And so, you know, I, I think what this means is we can either think about diversifying the field, and I, I would imagine that would be the best option, or if that's not, uh, not the case, and it certainly is not currently, wh what can we do to get better with, uh, with understanding other, other cultures, other races, other ethnicities, and, and helping to, to modify things so we can better treat them. All right, so modifiable factors then. Um, clinical equipoise, your preferences, how much you prefer uh, or, or feel strongly about an intervention. By definition, equipoise is not having a preference. So by definition, equipoise means you don't care. That, that you know, in, your, in your mind, you'll do whatever, and, and one intervention is not any d different than, than the other one for you. In a research study, that's ideal. 
because in a research study you like to think that there's not going to be that bias and so whatever arm of the study that the individual's in that they're going to be treated by a provider that, that does not have those strong feelings toward it. Now obviously that's not realistic and that probably plays a role in some of the findings when you look at who performs some of the studies but, but that would be ideal. In clinical practice having equipoise or not caring, probably not as good. Chad Cook did a study several years ago, and what they looked at was um, people with low back pain getting either spinal thrust manipulation or non-thrust mobilization. And, and what they found is what they typically find in most studies to compare one manual therapy to the other is it didn't make a difference. The patients in the study got better, but it, the groups didn't make a difference in, in whether or not they got better. The groups performed essentially the same. What they did find in the study, though, was that the equipoise or lack of equipoise of the provider did make a difference. And, and so if a provider preferred the thrust manipulations and was, was, um, it was giving the person thrust manipulations, their outcomes were better than if the provider performed the thrust manipulations and instead was using non-thrust mobilization. So it appears that your preferences and, and your beliefs about an intervention may enhance clinical outcomes and may make a difference. Your expectations can make a difference as well. There's a study from the placebo literature that, that looked at dentists and that were providing a painful tooth um, pr procedure. And there were two arms in the study. One arm got a uh, placebo or they got naloxone, which is an opioid antagonist. And so essentially that group was not getting a drug. Yeah, they, they were getting nothing that should have had an effect on their pain. The other arm of the study got placebo, they got, or they got naloxone, or they got a, an LG, I believe it was fentanyl. I think it was fentanyl, but, but what, whatever it was, it was a known powerful analgesic agent. So that group had a 33% chance of actually receiving the medication. Participants were blinded. They didn't know what, what they could possibly receive. Dentists were blinded to what the, the individual was receiving specifically, so they didn't know if they were receiving naloxone, they didn't know if they were receiving placebo, they didn't know if they were receiving fentanyl. Um, um, but they did know which group the individual was in, meaning that they knew if the individual was in the group that had no chance of getting fentanyl or if they were in the group that had the 33% chance of receiving the fentanyl. And what they found in that study was a significantly greater placebo response in the group that had the chance of, of receiving the fentanyl. And so what that was attributed to was something with the provider's expectations, that the provider knew that that group had a, at least a 33% chance of getting an actual medication, and, um, and something about that influenced how they interacted with them or, or how they, what they did with them that, that made a difference on their, their pain. This has also been found in the clinical literature as well. So a number of studies looking at it in the clinical literature find the provider's expectations early on are related to, to longitudinal outcomes as well. So, so your expectations for how that patient's going to do seems to, to be influential in the outcomes that are seen. And so the question is, what, why is it that this might occur? And we don't know, but, but there's some thought from some studies. This is one study that looked in osteopathic physicians that were providing manual therapy. And so there were two arms. One, one arm got the actual manual therapy. The other arm got a sham manual therapy. What they did, though, is they looked to see the interactions across. So this was They were looking to kind of set the stage for this study, so this was trying to go through and just look and see how everything worked out. And so one of the things they wanted to know was, was there difference in the interaction between the two groups? How the therapist treated people that were getting the sham versus how they treated people that are getting the actual manual therapy? Because the, this is one of the inherent issues with anything we do as rehabilitation providers, you can't blind people. You, you can't, it's very difficult to come up with a, a sham control for a rehabilitation intervention that, that can blind the person providing it. So, so obviously the practitioners knew that they were either given the, the placebo or they were given the actual intervention. What they found is that in the active participant groups, the um, providers had more instrumental exchanges, so they asked them more frequently about their comfort level during the procedure, the positioning. They talked to them more during the, the procedure. Higher listening quality, more reassurance, and then more relational proximity as well. So they laughed with them more, they joked around with them more, they expressed agreement with them more. There was also 
also a slightly longer visit duration time as well for the active group too. And, and again, this is a randomized controlled trial. This is highly controlled. The, the therapists in this were trained, they were monitored, they were retrained to assure that, that they, were, um, they were doing things in a very consistent manner. They wanted everything to be the same across groups, um, but, but even in this type of trial where everything is controlled, they still couldn't do it. You, know, you still see these differences where the people that are getting something that the therapists think actually may help them get treated differently than when the therapists are doing something that, uh, that they don't necessarily think may be helpful for them. And I, I think if you think about, you know, if, if you're a person that loves doing manual therapy or you love doing exercise with your patients, if you think about the excitement and enthousi enthusiasm that you, you show for that versus, and, and ultrasound's always the low-hanging fruit, but if a patient comes in and for whatever reason you decide, you, you, don't, you would not normally do ultrasound, but this patient, for whatever reason you have to do ultrasound on them, your interaction is likely going to be, much, your enthusiasm is going to be much different when you're doing what you like doing versus when you're doing what you really prefer not to do. All right, the placebo literature also gives us some insight into, uh, into attributes of the provider that may influence how people respond to us. A systematic review looked at this, and what they found is that placebo responses are greater if the participants of the opposite sex, so if the person providing the placebo is of a different sex than the person receiving the placebo, that results in a larger placebo response. If the person providing the placebo shows higher confidence, competence, and professionalism, that results in a greater placebo response. And then positive nonverbal behavior, such as smiling, strong tone of voice, eye contact, and then leaning toward the participant, all of those result in greater placebo responses as well. And, and so if we take the, the step of trying to translate this, I think we can assume that likely if this works for a placebo, that likely for our, our quote, active interview interventions that we do every day with our patients, these type of things are likely to enhance the effect that we see with that as well. Studies have looked at provider characteristics. One study of uh, over 300, close to 400 patients with chronic disease that were being seen by physical therapy found that outcomes were better in physical therapists who are calmer, um, more relaxed, secure, and resilient. And another study of people with shoulder pain found that outcomes were better in more outgoing or more energetic physical therapists. So your personality may influence how people respond. Again, that, that's likely very personalized. So some patients are probably gonna prefer a really outgoing and a therapist and respond to that. Others may prefer, prefer a more reserved one, but on average, this was found. And then therapeutic alliance is a consideration. I know that'll be talked about later today as well. But this is defined as that emotional union between the provider and the patient. It's really that collaborative sense between the, the two parties. This has been associated with improved outcomes in rehabilitation. And it's been shown that this is required for improved outcomes rather than a result of favorable changes. So that's the question is, you know, which comes first? Is therapeutic, strong therapeutic alliance result in better outcomes or just strong therapeutic alliance occur because the patient's responding well and, and they like you and you like them better? Um, so, so it does appear that this comes first and making that alliance seems to be the first step which then results in the, the favorable outcome. Strength of alliance seems to be due primarily to therapist qualities, so certainly the patient plays a role in that, but the therapist seems to play a stronger role in how strong that bond is. And then it's been suggested effective therapists are characterized by their ability to form alliance across a range of, of patients. So more effective therapists can form that bond with a, with a large range of patients. And then this is a study I'm just going to briefly go through that, that looked at what are the characteristics of therapeutic alliance in physical therapy and occupational therapy. And they came up with eight different factors. They came up with congruence or agreement on goals, um, connectedness or friendliness, empathy, communication, expectations of therapy. Um, in, in terms of how the therapy was going to be carried out, but also outcomes, how they thought they were going to do, individualized therapy, influencing factors such as a therapist's skill and the, the patient trust and dependability, the partnership between the two, and then the roles and responsibilities, particularly being a motivator and, and encouraging the, the patient as well. <clears throat> 
And for time, I'm going to skip through this. This, I, I think, is just this was another study that looked at qualities of a good physical therapist, and essentially, it's it's very comparable to what I just read you. So it's very comparable to, to what makes up a good therapeutic alliance. Also, seems to to be very influential in what makes a good physical therapist. All right. So how can we apply this to to clinical practice then? How can we apply some of this to clinical practice? First recommendation is that we need to collect outcomes. We need to collect outcomes and we need to collect them consistently on our patients because without outcomes, you have no idea if you're a high performing therapist or if you're a low performing therapist. Uh, I, I think in physical therapy, at least, we do a better job of this now than we used to. I, I work with, with students, I teach students, and, and so I. I know what they could do when they go out in their clinical experiences. And, and for a long time, they, they weren't collecting outcomes. Now it seems that they're collecting outcomes more regularly at the clinics they go to, but the outcomes are still collected at set time points. So they do a good job of getting the baseline. It seems most clinics are waiting until at least a four-week mark to get other ones. And the problem with that is a lot of patients self-discharge um, from therapy. So if, if you decide you're going to get outcomes at baseline and then wait four weeks, a lot of patients aren't going to be coming by the time that four-week mark rolls around, and you lose any insight into how they did. I think we like to sometimes think that we did a really good job with them, and they're not coming because they, they obviously got better. They don't need us anymore, but you don't know that. And, and so one thing that I think we need to do better as, as a profession is to, to collect outcomes and start to use that to, to self-assess. Tony DeLito likes the analogy of a baseball card, that if you get a baseball card, you can turn it over and you can look at the stats of the, the, the player. You can see what their batting average was in a given year, how many home runs they hit. And what he talks about is a similar approach for physical therapists, that potentially we keep track of our own stats. Um, you know, certainly, at the easiest level is use it to self-assess. How do I do with, with these? With, you know, I'm really good with people with shoulder pain, but I'm not so good with people with low back pain, so I need to find ways to get better at that. But also, more dramatically, potentially making that available to the public so they can make informed decisions. Maximize specific and contextual effects. We spend our whole careers trying to get better technically, you know, going to continue, continue education courses, reading the literature, trying to get ourselves better um, with those specific effects. With that, though, likely comes confidence, and, and that should help you as, as well. So, so you know, it doesn't mean that you give up and think there's no reason to, to try to become a better technical therapist, but doing that with the knowledge that the technical area should help, but also the confidence and the way you carry yourself may make a difference as well. Maximize the therapeutic alliance. Um, the working alliance inventory is the questionnaire that's most typically used in studies of physical therapy. So the studies that find there's a relationship between therapeutic alliance and rehabilitation outcomes most commonly use this, um, this tool. And so this is something that you can look at. Those studies don't tend to give it to the patient with the knowledge that the therapist is going to be able to read it. So I don't know how, what kind of uh, answers you would get from the patient uh, if you had them do this clinically. But I think you can look this over, realize this is how you're being judged, and, and start to think about what areas do I do well, and maybe what areas do I not do so well. And then what we like to talk about is, is the, the, this kind of this dating system. Uh, you know, for some of the dating sites, they have complex algorithms where people go in and they fill out questionnaires about themselves, and then they use that to determine compatibility and try to make a match. Rather than the typical approach to rehabilitation where the patient is, is scheduled based on where their insurance company tells them they can go, or the convenience of getting to the clinic, um, or, or who's available, you know, who has the first opening on their schedule. Maybe Maybe a more thoughtful approach to trying to match patients with therapists that, that are likely to, to have similar values as them and, and potential to have better outcomes with them. And so this was looked at then in a, in a study from Mental Health, which, which used a similar outcomes as what we talked about before. So what they thought was that, can we match patients to the therapist that's likely to be beneficial for them? They had 48 mental health therapists, 288 patients, and they were randomly assigned to either usual scheduling, where they were just arbitrarily placed on somebody's schedule, or match therapist effectiveness based on the, the, the effectiveness of the therapist for, for their domain. So before the study, they monitored these therapists, they, watched, they had them treat a number of different patients, and they found where they were effective, which domains they were effective in. When a patient came in, 
they then saw where they were most impacted, what domain, and then tried to match them with a therapist that was good in that domain. And what they found was match condition brought in greater improvement in general impairments, um, greater improvement in psychological distress, and in domain-specific impairments as well. And what they concluded was that the good fit in the study came not from changing what the therapist did, because they let the therapist just keep doing what they were doing. They did not to try to change what they did with the patient, but instead who they treated using that approach. And so in conclusion, therapist effect exists. Um, it's small to modest, but it may be clinically meaningful over time. High performing therapists may be domain specific, so you may be very good in one outcome domain and, and less so in another. Therapist effects are likely driven by technical abilities, but also heavily driven by contextual factors. And then while continuing to improve technical skills, therapists should be aware to work and maximize contextual factors as well. And then finally, outcomes, outcomes, outcomes. We need outcomes to know where we stand. So thank you. And All right, we do have a couple questions. So Stay put. I'm going to stay down here. Um, okay, so we have a, a question from Eric Goldberg. In your opinion, what outcomes are most important to collect and therefore attract? Are these those easily accessible to all? Yeah. So, so that that and, and therein is is the the, the question. Yeah, you know, I, I think. What was done in those studies with 12 different outcomes was, was amazing, but obviously the burden on, on clinicians, the burden on the, the, the patients, it's not gonna allow that. Um, you know, we, we used to get pushed back about just trying to have people complete two things, like a pain, pain uh, rating and, uh, and, and an oswestry. And, and so th there has to be the trade-off be behind that. Um, I think pain and disability are, are the obvious answers on that. So something for pain, something for disability. I think psychological distress can, is, is a good one as well. Um, the, the impact study recommended um, four, four, well, four primary domains, but, but pain, interference with daily activity, emotional distress, and then fatigue was, was another one as well, as, as well as um, satisfaction with, with it as well. So I think those are all kind of options for it. We, we've done a study where we've looked at what outcomes patients um, feel are important, and, and what we asked them about was pain, fatigue, emotional stress, and interference with daily activity, and we found clusters. We found subgroups of individuals. So these are all physical therapy patients, but there was a subgroup of physical therapy patients that only cared about pain. So pain was the most important outcome for them to, to show improvement in. There was a subgroup that wanted pain and interference, to improve, and so those were the two most important ones for them. And, and those ones are, are kind of the, you know, the, the, that's the, the slam dunks for us. I think that's what we, as physical therapists, what we tend to work on. But there was a third group of individuals, and again, these are physical therapy patients. These are patients attending physical therapy and asked what outcomes are important to them in response to their physical therapy, and they wanted improvement in everything. They wanted improvement in pain and interference with daily activities, but they also wanted to have improvement in, um, in, in emotional distress and fatigue as well. So I think, and you can tell me if I'm off base, I think there isn't one outcome that we're looking for, so we should pick a, meaning one, a meaningful one yeah. and do it consistently. You can, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, that I think is a strong point. At least do something consistently, even if you're not getting the optimal outcome measures, as long as you're doing something consistently and as rehabilitation providers, pain and, and disability are probably the, the two good ones. But certainly, I, I think as you start to reflect on yourself, you, you, there may be other outcomes that are of value to patients and valued as important to patients that you may be very good at um, helping them with, and so that may not be reflected in, in just those the couple of outcomes. Awesome. Okay, we have another question from Dalton Derthick. Um, sorry if I mispronounced that. How would you recommend either faculty or CIs help students to better understand and improve these soft skills so that they have had some practice prior to beginning their career? Any particular practices, feedback, or advice? Yeah, and I'm probably not gonna give a very satisfying answer on that one. Um, but, but, but so what I'll tell you is, is that my own personal opinion is I, I think as rehabilitation providers, most of us are pretty damn good at that already. You know, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of you, that's what drove you to the profession. <laughs> And, and like I think of our students, and, and I mean, they're, they're just amazing people. They're just really great people. So I, I, I think 
one consideration is just to acknowledge that. You know, I, I think a lot of times we, we're looking for the hard science that, uh, you know, somebody's getting better because we've developed the optimal exercise that's strengthening this, this muscle, and that's what they really need. That if we can't get that muscle strong, if we don't give them the right, right dosage and the right exercise and the optimal way to do it, that that's, that's what we need to do to get them better, and that's why they get better. Or the manual therapy technique has to be done just right. And in reality, I, I think a lot of why people respond is based on these soft skills. I think a lot of providers do it well already, but I think number one, just to acknowledge it, don't beat yourself up because uh, you think that you're having a hard time finding that specific little thing or treating that specific little thing and acknowledge that these are influential in it. Um, but then self-reflection as well. And if there are parts of this that, that maybe, you know, you know as faculty, I, I think we, we always, you know, we, we interact with the students, we, we, we go through. And so we see when somebody is being defensive or, or not. We, we do um, a year-end competency. It's a, basically an OSCE for the students where they have patient situations. And we film these. And, uh, and, and then we, we go back and we, we look at them and we get feedback from the, the actors or standardized patients. We get feedback from the actors about it. But most of the students do really well. But occasionally you get somebody on something like that that, that is just just doing something that's off. You know, one, one example we had years ago where one student just stood right over the, the act. They hadn't been on their clinicals yet, but the whole time was just standing right over the actor, and the actor commented on it. And, and so things like that, you know, you, we can bring that to their attention. You know, call the student in. The student was mortified. They had no idea. But, but things like that you, you may not be aware of. Okay, we have time for one more from Matt Scarsbrook. If you were designing the patient therapist compatibility, compatibility algorithm based on your reading, would you put greater weighting on level of therapist expertise or greater patient therapist values overlap? Um, I would put it more on the values. So the, the expertise hasn't really panned out to, to be that influential. So, you know, more experienced therapists, outcomes are not dramatically different, much as we'd like to think that would be the case. So they, they aren't as dramatically different as we'd like to think. And so, so yeah, so I, I, in, in my opinion and based on what I've read, I would think that uh, the, the values in, in matching that way is going to be more important. Awesome. Okay, so um, it is 11.15, so it's time for a, a short 15-minute break. So you can, again, stretch your legs, get some sunshine, and then we will be back here at um, 11.30 for our next speaker. So one more round of applause for our speaker. And, what, what I'll tell you, if, if anybody has any questions, if, if you want the slides or anything, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm always on email, so love to love to hear from you.